Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. What's up, guys? Big Jeb here, back with another reaction video. All right, we're doing uh, the Napoleonic Wars. We're continuing it. It's uh, been raining for days on end. It's pretty cold considering it's June, and it's a great day to sit inside and learn about history. If you like that, if you like stuff like that, if you want me to react to certain videos or learn about history, I'd love you to join the channel. Subscribers, just make some room. Bring up a chair, guys. And uh, would love to have you. Let's get into it. Um, original video at the top description below. Go check out, check out Epic History. I would advise watching the first three episodes, either my reactions to them or straight from the source on Epic History. Let's get into it. Uh, Portugal, stuff for Portugal at the end of the last one. Um, the One Kings and Generals video that I've seen, uh, Cochrane, I think Thomas Cochrane, might be wrong on the first name, but Cochrane, he was a big uh, British Royal Navy guy. Um, not as big as uh, Nelson, I guess, um, but great uh, video on that channel. I've been getting some requests to uh, look at some uh, Kings and Generals videos, which I will do in the near future. But yeah, I, I remember hearing about, at the end of that video, about how the uh, king and queen fled Portugal during the Napoleonic Wars to their colony, Brazil. And I know at the uh, when the Napoleonic Wars uh, ends up ending, um, they put their son in charge, uh, so the prince of Portugal in charge of Brazil, and then head back. And the and the son actually ends up heading a, you know, war of independence against his own parents back in Portugal. I hope I didn't get any of that wrong. I did only see that video once about it, but that's cool that it's kind of being tied tied in here. Uh, waited long enough. Let's get into it. Sorry. But yeah, Portugal left, and I really know very little about this, and so I might not talk as much but that might be a good thing so let's get into it let's learn in the autumn of 1807 french emperor napoleon bonaparte dominated europe he had humbled austria and prussia and sealed an alliance with russia of the major powers only britain still defied him safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain. The so-called Continental System, or Blockade, designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. a cool name for a king, Carlos. King Carlos. Each other like it. was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown Very prince standard. loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by chief minister Manuel Godoy, Queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed, and he devised a plan to seize control of the country. Sort of terrifying. In the spring of 1808, the under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic... So I just want to say about Napoleon's height. So that's the kind of like uh, stereotype. There's some people who are saying that, you know, for his time, he wasn't that short. Uh, but it's clearly then a propaganda thing because even in portraits with people from his time, he seems uh, short. But of course, you know, we did the same thing in World War II with Hitler and, and the Japanese kind of caricatures and stuff like that. And maybe that's kind of the same deal. But... Yeah, not that In important position, video, but guarding Spain against the thing. British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the Palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat 
and 50,000 troops again. to restore order in Madrid. But on the 2nd of May, 1808... Other than Napoleon, of course, that, that guy, or this guy right here, this general, seems to be the most uh, kind of prominent face in this thing. Uh, I recognize him. I've seen him in a lot of the episodes. The people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets. Hey, I recognize that painting. This is something like, even if you don't know that much about history, if you were in a history class growing up, I think most people at least kind of recognize this painting. I mean, if they can't say, you know, what's it portraying and when was it painted, but it, it's just recognizable. And executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain oh. on his own brother, Joseph. Joseph. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honor. They were godless atheists who during the French... Wow. Um, so much in this, in this episode that I knew nothing about and getting me excited for the rest of the episode. But, so this is very early 1800s. I think 1807 it was. So... The Spanish and Portuguese, who were kind of the original European explorers, um, I guess, um, Columbus, Italian or something, regardless of Columbus, they were the, kind of the first two in, in Europe to really go out, and then you have the Dutch, and um, Dutch might be. Anyone who knows more about exactly, you know, colon, you know exploration, uh, if the Dutch were kind of in there with the Portuguese and the Spanish at first, but I just... I need to know more about uh, Spanish history at, at this point. They're obviously declining, but they're, they seem to be very religious and Napoleon not that way. And that's really, I just, I know French very well about this topic. Obviously. rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters Francisco of War Goya. series. That's, that's a name. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia, and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops. While the Look Spanish... how close to the uh, coast uh, Barcelona is. Probably should have known that. Madrid is the capital. Sharp Off topic. And Zaragoza were besieged by French troops. While the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordova, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, wow. about half of whom later died of starvation. So is this like one of the first kind of losses I've, I've it, it is it's got to be it is definitely is in the series so far the kind of main you know just a loss in any sense of the word for the french and it came southern spain that's interesting berlin was a humiliation for france her first major defeat since napoleon became emperor france's enemies across europe were delighted napoleon was incandescent with fury the situation went from bad to worse. 
the Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Saragossa. Wow, props to Spain. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. Wow. Props. To Spain. Um, imagine that, having, like, all the rage of seeing him come in and be put as your, as your king, this, you know, this French guy who just, his brother put him in power after he kind of, I don't know if conquered Spain is the right word, but definitely uh, put down any resistance. And then you actually are able to push him back out. Imagine like the national pride they must have felt after that. Um, I'm not sure if it ends up well in the near future, but that's cool. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called I a love. war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. Oh, cool. So is, um, this is why I love these the moments like this, right? Why I love making the channel. Obviously, you guys are great and awesome. I love interacting with you guys. But in terms of just watching the videos, when I, I kind of get a glimpse of like, oh, I kind of know where this might be going. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Um, doesn't like Trafalgar happen over here and uh, like the Admiral Nelson gets involved and stuff like that. Maybe I'm wrong, let's see. 17th but... of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France with all their arms and plunder using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent I don't want to rewind again, but I have to. I just don't plunder quite get to repatriate Junot and his army to France with all their arms and plunder using British ships. I want to say, why would he do that? But I'm assuming they're about to explain. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. So they just help. Why would they do that? Well, um, they help some of the French soldiers and leaders out of like hostility and back to France. Um, I'm assuming they're going to. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. He wanted done right. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. That's why I love this channel. I feel like the, the music kind of gets a little... Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, louder, often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which so burst like across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 so Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca oh, no, after no, no, no. a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced. Bad news, guys. 
But in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well trained, organized, and led. Maybe it's not so deserved, but I think all the you know evidence is there that shows that just the discipline of in the kind of army ranks in Britain seemed just to be kind of stand out a bit. Uh, just kind of the stoic nature, maybe. Just me with a bias, but I don't know. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless Obviously, to... Napoleon and the French are pretty darn well organized, so maybe that's not uh, so true. ...divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sargoon on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. This channel is so good at building up as it goes along in the episode. Getting more intense. While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud, and bitter... In a case like this, would you ditch all of your heavy artillery, like your heavy guns and equipment? Um, because the pursuing army, I'm guessing, is going to want that when they face you. And um, I perhaps, I perhaps, obviously, they could let, you know, their heavy guns behind too and just kind of catch up them with horses or on foot. Um, yeah. They're cold. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness. Well, Except there goes my stoic kind of faith in that over there. Obviously, the, the French are guard, which fought several skillful delaying actions on another, another and kept level. the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite For 95th now. rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialized light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that cool. spun them. Cool. So this is kind of an insight into the creating of the more modern army where you, it's less about just like pride of your colors and more about what is tactically beneficial and useful and obviously the grooves uh spinning the uh projectile makes it travel in a more straight line uh, it seems to be a shorter barrel but maybe the grooves make up for the uh accuracy that a longer barrel gives bullet as it was fired making them slower to load but much more accurate yeah despite a much shorter barrel in one too. legendary incident during moore's retreat at cacabelos Rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards. Sorry, so much shows so much uh, how uh, accuracy is increased with a uh, spinning projectile. Some say interesting. out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards. Some say further. Wow. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British that length, kept one I'm step you've ahead of the French. Into account the curve of on the bullet. New Year's Eve, Napoleon, as in like the the effect of gravity on the bullet, kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris: rumors of plots and Austria mobilizing once more for war. The emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him. 
and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January, 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. I love how Napoleon always has his hand like, like a boss, just like in his pocket. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port so meant good. supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them. I know when the uh, map turns to this, away from the kind of just basic flag posts and more zoomed out into a more zoomed in, much more detailed kind of topography and groups. Uh, it's not just the flags, it's actually showing the little kind of brigades. Uh, you can tell a big battle is about to happen. To delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. Maybe not. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñasquedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. Were there any cannon ships with cannons um, that could kind of bombard? Um, the broken terrain of walls, hedges, and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now, he hurriedly cancelled that order ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Reminds me of Dunkirk. Then, the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia, and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal. It took me a second to process that. I, I, I just sort of assumed he got shit, hit, shit in the shoulder. <laughs> he got hit in the shoulder by a musket ball. It, it obviously said cannonball, so... Pretty sure even if a cannonball nicks... Like, you're... you're he's got to look terrible. If this, if this cannonball even close to directly hit his shoulder... Oh, that's got to be gruesome. And he was carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. How good is this? Sorry. How good is this channel? How good is this? Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British Army from the dying moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6 p.m., 
Dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground and two were set on fire, but overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea before surrendering. Spanish are brave. That, that's what I'm getting here in this episode. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And yeah, that felt a lot like Did he abandon like Spain in its hour of need? Or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would return to fight another day. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. It, this little like question, before the scale of his mistake was evident then he would say i am bar right there i don't know if you guys can see it suggests in napoleon's vietnam spain 1809 to 1811 i kind of see the american revolution as uh i'm not going to go on on this much uh you or if you meet as like uh um i don't want to go into that i just scratch that statement forget it marked pretty badly on this affair i admit it the immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. That was awesome. That went by pretty quick too. Um, I knew very little about that special that section, especially that episode. Austria fights back. Um, okay, um, great episode, like always, as I expected. Um, Keep recommending if you're not subscribed. Love you to join us. Uh, thanks, guys, for all the love and comments. Keep it up. See you guys next time.